Um, thank you. That was actually a fascinating discussion and segues perfectly into what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes this afternoon. I, um, I can't for the life of me try to put in context or manage or give you pearls of wisdom uh, relevant to the rawness and the trauma and the shattering that you have heard about over these last few days. What I hope I can do, though, is try to answer a question. And the question I want to help answer is whether or not Israel is still resilient. You know, some of the things that, that uh, Yotem and Nava were just talking about right now. Uh, Saul Singer and I, who wrote Startup Nation over a decade ago, wrote another book called The Genius of Israel, The Surprising Resilience of a Divided Nation in a Turbulent World. And resilience is the piece I'm going to focus on because we tried to explain in our book why Israel is a model for resilience for societies around the world that are collapsing, that are in crisis, that Israel has the playbook. Now, Israel has had the playbook based on decades of dealing with traumas, both external and internal. And you can go back to the founding of the state and that miraculous victory at the founding of the state. Or you go back to internal debates in the 1950s, like debates about whether or not Israel should accept reparations from the government of West Germany for the Shoah, which ripped the country apart, ripped this country apart. Or you fast forward to the early 1980s during the first Lebanon war, where the size of the protests relative to the size of the population eclipsed the protests we saw in this country in 2023. The protests got so tense that they sometimes turned violent. One anti-government protester was killed by pro-government protesters. Or of course you fast forward to the gut-wrenching assassination of an Israeli prime minister by a Jewish Israeli citizen in which literally half the country basically blamed the other half of the country for creating a political environment where something like that can happen. And I can go on and on and on. I don't, I'm not here to chronicle the parade of horrors and horribles throughout Israeli history. But there are important lessons that we chronicle in our book about how Israel has bounced back. And so the question we have is, does Israel still have that resilience? Now, we wrote this book before October 7th. We wrote this book when we thought the resilience that Israelis would need and what the West could learn from Israel was bouncing back and uniting from the judicial reform crisis of 2023. The judicial reform crisis seems like such a quaint time. If we could just return to that. So that was the book. That was the question we tried to answer. We laid out a framework. I don't know if it still holds. I think it does. But I just want to... I just want to give you the opportunity to think about whether or not these things hold. Now, I'm going to show one slide here. This is a um, quote from a book review in the New York Times. I like to think it's the nicest thing the New York Times has said about me or Israel. Uh, I don't think that was their intention. Um, but this is Ethan Bronner from the New York Times when the book came out November 1st, 2023. So keep in mind, this is after a year of judicial reform chaos and then, of course, October 7th. He says, this does not, like, we were holding up Israel as a country for the world to emulate. He says, this does not sound like a country any sane person would emulate. Yet the authors have written a book under the title The Genius of Israel, and while their timing couldn't be worse, thank you, New York Times, while their timing couldn't be worse, the volume does offer important insights into a nation that has punched far above its weight, even as it now grapples with existential crises, both external and internal. If Israelis, and this is the key point, if Israelis recover from the brutal Hamas attack of October 7th and reestablish na re national equilibrium, what's written in this book will help reveal how they did it. So again, we didn't write about October 7th. But what the New York Times is saying, we don't know if they'll bounce back. And in fact, if you read the rest of the view, they're skeptical. The Times is skeptical that Israel will bounce back. But if Israel bounces back, the societal shock absorbers, the societal guardrails, the societal ethos that we marveled at when we wrote this book, we hope will explain why. Now, the data 
is perplexing. I just Because the data was there before October 7th, and it's still there now. And I want to go through some of the data that help explain why we think Israel is a societal and resilient miracle and model. Okay, so this data is going to be a little jarring. Breaking news today. The UN Happiness Report came out and ranked Israel as the fifth happiest country in the world. I'm not joking. Today, today, by the way, when Andre, when they asked me, the JFN asked me to do this speech, they did not know, nor did I, that today would be the day that the UN would be coming out with this report. Now, I want to say something here, okay? The UN does this report every single year. It's a three-year rolling average. So they take happiness data of a country rolling into three years, all right? And they release this report every year. One of the reasons we wrote our book is because of how confused we were by this data. Now, we try to look in our book through the lens of people who aren't as dialed in or biased or naturally passionate about Israel, like someone like by the name of Tiffany Wen, who we write about, who's an Asian-American, non-Jewish journalist, lived in San Francisco, came to, the United, came to Israel because she was dating an Israeli guy, enrolled at Tel Aviv University, and then she was like, what is with this place? Why are all these people so happy? This place is tense. They're always arguing with each other. Everyone here lives with some semblance of a security threat. At the time, she didn't fully appreciate what that would be. It's expensive. People seem kind of annoyed, and yet they're happy. She wrote a piece for the Daily Beast called Why Are Israelis So Damn Happy? So she was like stranger in a strange land, and we looked at this through her eyes, and then we stumbled upon the happiness report, which she saw too. Israel's consistently ranked now among the top 10 of happy countries. Now, when we say happy, we don't mean like people with a smiley face skipping around, isn't this great? What the UN measures is what they call life satisfaction. Do people feel like they are leading satisfied, they're satisfied with the lives they're leading? Do they believe they're leading lives with meaning and purpose? And therefore, it's not surprising that with all its challenges that Tiffany Wen stumbled upon, Israel is one of the top five countries even after a year like 2023. Now, this is one of the other reasons. Data's paradoxical. Israel's demographic miracle. There's a demographic crisis going on in the world today. Populations around the world are shrinking. We've never seen this in modern times. The problem is most acute with wealthy countries. That is to say, the more affluent you become as a country, the fewer children you create. This is an ironclad demographic fact of life, an ironclad demographic law. The more economically productive countries become, the less reproductive they become. And we are living in a world in which now the world is getting wealthier and wealthier, and most countries now are aging and shrinking. And that is a death spiral for countries, not only to become less innovative, but they become, there's a whole societal and social capital breakdown as the countries become basically a bunch of older people and very few young people. The, the pointy end of the spear of this is in Japan, but other countries are not far behind in Europe, and the U.S. is not far behind, uh, the U.S. is not far behind Europe. In Japan, just to put this in context today, the market for adult diapers is larger than the market for baby diapers. We have that stat in our book. Now, I was in Japan in last April when I would talk to government leaders and say, what's the biggest threat? What's the biggest challenge facing your country? I was expecting they would say China. They'd say, no, it's demography. This is what we're focused on. By the way, just one thing here. What's amazing here is you see wealth going up. So the blue line, uh, so if you just go through here, okay, so the blue line is Israel. The red line is the rest of the world. Just focus on the blue and the red. The blue line's Israel, so GDP per capita going up. If you go all the way over here, female participation in the labor force going up. And Israel is the only country who has those dynamics and also has fertility rate going up. Here's another amazing stat. Here's basically all these relevant countries. On the x-axis is economic wealth on a per capita basis. On the y-axis, fertility. Israelis are way above the fertility rate. They are a young and growing country. All these other countries are below the replacement rate. They are all shrinking and aging. Now, people say it's the Haredim. Aha, it's the Haredim. We know the silver bullet. We understand Israel's secret weapon. 
It is true, the Haredim contribute to Israel's demographic miracle. But what makes Israel unique is it's not only the Haredim. In fact, if you look at where all the real growth is coming, it's from the traditionally observant, traditional but not very observant, and secular. In Israel, radically secular young people have three, four, and five children. You spend time with techies in Tel Aviv or television types in Tel Aviv, and you ask them, how many kids they have relative to their peers in San Francisco or L.A. or Berlin and London. They can't even compare. They're all having lots of children. This is the Japan uh, graph I showed you, just to, to give you a sense. This is, this is where the whole world is heading in terms of demography, looking like that. And this is where Israel is. Israel is a young country. Some other amazing stats. Deaths of despair. These are deaths from alcohol abuse, drug abuse, suicide. It's a crisis in the United States. Again, we mapped out almost every country in the OECD. Israel is the lowest. Israel simply doesn't have deaths of despair. They're the only country in the world, that, or at least in the OECD, that has eluded this trend. Teen suicide. There's a teen mental health crisis going on all over the West. Israel is one of the two lowest, the two, one of two countries with the lowest teen suicide rate in the OECD. It's just basically non-existent. They're all the way at the end there. Just to give you a sense, Israel yellows all the way at the end. Here's the United States. The CDC came out with a report last March saying there is a teen suicide crisis in the United States like we have never seen before. So, the data is confounding. It's perplexing. It doesn't make sense. In two to three minutes, I'm going to try to explain to you why the whole world has a loneliness crisis, a mental health crisis, a suicide crisis, a deaths of despair crisis, a demography crisis, and Israel's the only one that doesn't. One, this is a country where people feel like they're part of something larger than themselves. And being part of something larger than yourself gives you meaning and connection. And when you have meaning and connection, you are happy you feel like you're leading a satisfied life. You don't, you know, seclude yourself into pockets of despair and depression. You want to participate in that project, in that society. You want to build it. You want to contribute to it. You want to add children to it because you are contributing and living with something larger than yourself. This is a country of service. Service is a big thing here. It starts at every, it goes through every stage of life. Young people in the Scouts movement, most Israelis, young Israelis participate in the Scouts movement where they're participating, participating in a sort of public service project that's larger than themselves. In the military that most Israelis serve in, there's three values, three benefits to it. One, it gives them incredible skills that we wrote, leadership skills that we wrote about in Startup Nation. But we didn't write about in Startup Nation, which we read about in this book is it gives Israelis a sense that they really are participating in something larger than themselves. And all their incentives are to succeed in that project is to be part of a group, have a group mindset, a gibush mindset that we write about, to have a sense of team, community. If you are good at that, you will get into the best units in the IDF. Unlike the US college system, where you are rewarded for individual excellence. What was my score? What was my test? What was my GPA? What kind of recommendation letter can I get? Me, 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 me. In the IDF, it doesn't matter how talented you are. You will not get into the best units if you only think about me, and young people understand that from a young age. That's the incentive system. And three, it allows Israelis a space for them to work together from all walks of life religious and secular Israelis, Israelis from Tel Aviv or the struggling towns of the periphery, Jews from the east, Jews from the west, working together in their military service and then the Milouim for the next 20 years or beyond, as we've seen since October 7th. And when they have that space, they stop looking at one another as the other. They realize they're part of something larger than themselves. Next, I would say that this is a country of ritual. As our friend Mika Goodman told us when we're working on the book, rituals, rituals are not created by a community. Rituals create community. 
Rituals create community. We, we can't go around saying, we need a ritual. No, rituals create community. And this is a country of rituals. And I don't need to tell this audience what the Hebrew calendar is like, but the most important date for us that we write about in our book, we have a dedicated chapter called Thanksgiving Every Week. That in this country, they have a Thanksgiving every week. Every Friday night, the country slows down. People come together. Families, communities, and a country. Overwhelming majority of Israelis, according to all the data, overwhelming majority of Israelis do something on Shabbat. Some may do something very secular, or some may do something very traditional. But the point is they're with family, multiple generations, two, three, sometimes four generations. And when they're doing that, they recognize and they're in their like subconscious that the whole country is doing it too. In the United States, we have a huge problem where older people have no communication with younger people. There's no intergenerational connection. That's not only important for keeping families together and family history intact and remembered, but giving young people a sense of history of where they come from, where their society comes from, where their country comes from, where it matters and why it matters. We cite one study in our book that shows that an staggering high number of older people go through an entire week in the, in the United States without ever actually having a conversation with some or someone younger than 30 years old. Now, I don't want to embarrass her, but my mother's here who lives in Jerusalem. Her name's Helen Senor. I don't also want to embarrass her by citing her age, but let's just say she's not under 30, okay? But every Friday night, she's with my sister and my nieces in Jerusalem spending Shabbat together, Thanksgiving every single week, multiple generations, the story continues. And you see this throughout the calendar. It's not just Shabbat. It's not just the Jewish holidays. It's the civil holidays. It's Yom Hazikaron, where the whole country stops for two minutes when those sirens go off. Many of you have experienced that. And they get out of their cars, and they get out of their classrooms, and they get out of their hotels, and they get out of their restaurants, and they are in that moment. It's an individual moment the remembering a loved one, a student, a friend, a parent, a sibling who was killed in service of this country, but it's also a collective experience. It's a, an experience in the life of the nation. In the United States, these rituals have withered. What is Memorial Day? When my Israeli friends come to, come to the United States, they ask me, what are Memorial Day sales? <laughs> like they're perplexed that this, that this, this cherished holiday has been so commercialized. And then, and then the genius, the genius of having Memorial Day here go right into Yom Hatzma'ut, right into Independence Day. So the message to every Israeli of every generation is, we got this independence because of that, because of the sacrifices of that. And I can go on and on and on with the role the rituals play in keeping this country together and keeping this country resilient. And I'll just close with two very final thoughts, and I'll do this in a minute. One, Mika Goodman, who's a character in our book, said something that is very, was very powerful to me. He says, as I said at the beginning, meaning comes from when you feel that there are things bigger than you happening, bigger than your life, and that you can touch those things. You can have an impact on those things. And he says, Israel is a small country with a big story. He says, now look, there are plenty of big countries that have big stories. The United States is a big country. It has a big story. It has a very important story. I would argue that the U.S. and Israel are the only two countries that were founded as a cause. China is a big country, and it has a big story. But the problem with big countries with big stories is individual citizens can't really touch them and shape them and have an impact on them. There are small countries that have small stories. So you can have impact in a small European country or in Canada, or I'm not picking on any of these countries, but one asks, what does it really matter? Israel's unique. It's a tiny country with a massive story. I mean, literally of biblical proportions, right? And what happens here not only matters to the most recent few thousand years of Jewish history, but the next few thousand years of Jewish history. When you think of what happened here since October 7th, 
This doesn't matter just in the moment. It's not just a security crisis in the moment. It has implications for hundreds, thousands of years, potentially. How Israel responds, how Israelis respond, how many of us as philanthropists respond in this moment. And that's what's unique about Israel. It's this tiny place where every Israeli feels like it's theirs, that they can touch it, they can shape it, they can have impact on it. Their national service plays a role in determining its outcome. And so I'm still optimistic. I still believe Israel is resilient. And I think we're seeing that play out, and I know some of you are Israeli who are here, and some of you are here because you want to help Israel. There are causes that I'm involved with through JFN and other causes, like the Day After Fund that I work on with the uh, Pauli Singer Foundation, and there are, there are tons of projects here that I know people care about. I cannot tell you that this tiny little country with a really, really big story needs all of that help right now as we lock arms in unity and solidarity with our brothers and sisters in this country as they face the greatest test of resilience in their lifetimes. And if they persevere, which I believe they will do, I believe that data will hold, I think what we wrote in our book is true, which it not only speaks to the success and the vibrancy of this country, but it will continue to be not only a technology and innovation model for the world, but a social miracle that the West is roiling from a social crisis and will be looking to the Israeli playbook. Thanks for listening.